I'm certain people will continue to trickle in, hopeful people will continue to trickle in, but we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Um, I'll introduce myself briefly and then we'll pray and then we'll get this uh, ship out of the harbor. Uh, my name is Jake Abel and I am so delighted to be a parishioner here at St. Albans and I teach French language and literature uh, in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures at Baylor, where I was also a student many years ago. Uh, and I am a medievalist by training, which means that I get to nerd out about this kind of stuff all day long for my job. It's really, really great. Uh, so it's a privilege to get to talk with you today about St. Alban, um, specifically in the context of an old French, a medieval French version of his life story that um, I've started working with as part of a book project. So more about that anon. For now, uh, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the occasion to gather together in person to discuss the lives of the saints. Um, and we pray that the example of St. Alban, the proto-martyr of England, might inspire us to holy and good things today and in all the days of our lives. Amen. Okay, so, St. Alban. This is fun uh, for obvious reasons, because obviously St. Alban is... Uh, near and dear to us as a saint. We are named for this saint who here is represented in an icon that actually comes from a Greek Orthodox monastery on the East Coast. And I show this to you in part to indicate that St. Alban is venerated. He is someone who is acknowledged as a saint, a holy figure by Roman Catholics, by the Eastern Orthodox tradition, and of course by us Anglicans. Um, so he's beloved by, by many folks. So who was St. Alban? Well, like a lot of ancient saints, uh, he's somebody about whom we know extremely little, uh, and the precious little evidence that there is for his life um, at the historical level is, is all very difficult to parse, um, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But first I want to dwell on this expression, the proto-martyr of Britain, which is one of the expressions that gets attached to Mr. St. Alban. Um, Martyr, right? Uh, this is a word that we associate with people who die, who are killed for the faith. Um, and historically, this is a word we further associate with people from the ancient churches, right? So we might be aware of the fact that in the first several hundred years of the church's life, right, that um, especially before Christianity becomes illicit religion to practice in the Roman Empire, both East and Western empires, and well before it becomes the state religion, um, it can be dangerous to varying degrees, right, to be a Christian in the early centuries of the church. So during this time, it was not necessarily uncommon, depending on when and where you lived, to um, face the possibility of being, uh, you know, killed uh, for the faith. Um, you might uh, be in a situation where you had to become an apostate, right, renounce Christianity, renounce Christ, or affirm your faith and subsequently be killed. And We'll have more to say in a moment about what might occasion that fault line between, say, civic duty or cultural duty and your Christian identity. But suffice it to say that St. Alban is remembered uh, for being one of these martyrs. And here you see this lovely illustration from this, the old French version of the life of St. Alban, which I'll set up in a moment, uh, where he's having his head spectacularly cut off uh, by somebody who's not doing so well either. You can see his eyes are, are falling out. Um, <laughs> context to follow. <laughs> but I say this by way of just indicating uh, that the, the culture of martyrdom, right, which is not uncommon in those early centuries of the, of the church, that is the culture out of which the cult of the saints begins historically. So Theology 101, sort of long story made very, very short and very reductively, um, as things, as those early persecutions die down a bit, as the Roman Empire and empires east and west become increasingly Christianized, the possibility in the Mediterranean of dying for the faith becomes a little bit less common than it was. So there's this kind of question that emerges, well, what are the new sort of standards of heroism in the faith? How are we going to look to exemplars of the faith if people aren't dying in the same way for their Christian identity? No one ever quite poses the question that way, right? But that's sort of the emerging uh, dilemma or question that emerges within the churches. Um, and it's sort of in this void that was left by the martyrs that the saints gradually emerge in the three, four, five hundreds AD and onward. Um, and this 
culture of looking to particular exemplars of the faith um, becomes increasingly popular in the Catholic Middle Ages, which is the period that I study. So St. Alban is kind of bridging a lot of these cultures. On the one hand, he's a martyr. He's someone who dies for the faith. He gets beheaded here by some folks. Again, more about that shortly. Um, but he's also somebody who's then looked back to specifically as a saint. And while he probably lives in the two or three hundreds, right, so in the latter days of the Western Roman Empire, he's somebody here who is, you know, visibly constructed in this medieval scene, right? So he's remembered as this sort of medievalish saint, even though he lives historically in the late antique period. So who is this guy? Well, he's a late antique convert to Christianity. Um, he is, and I'll give you the full summary of the story in just a moment. He's a Roman citizen who lives in the British Isles during a time of Christian persecution. Which wave of persecution? We don't know. We have absolutely no idea. There's a full 120 year range in which scholars debate when St. Alban might have actually lived, ranging from the early 200s to the early 300s. So he might have lived under waves of persecution by Septimus Severus, by Diocletian. These are different you know, Roman rulers. We just don't know. But the story, as it comes down to us, sets up the life of St. Alban as somebody who's living in Roman Britain, right, in one of these waves of persecution. And he's also subsequently the subject of a lot of stories in different language that celebrate his sacrifice for a priest named Amphibolus. And it's that story of his sacrifice for this priest that becomes the, the story of his life as a saint. It's what makes him a saint. So, before I tell you the story, let me set up a couple facts about this particular story. So the life of St. Alban, as it comes down to us in this French version, is called La Vie de Saint Alban. And uh, just in case you thought you knew how to pronounce Alban, uh, you don't. Uh, Alban is the nasalized medieval French way that you would have said this. Um, how fun is that? Uh, why, why are we talking about nasalized French pronunciations? Well. In 30 seconds, right, and I, we have some medieval English people in the room. In 1066, right, this upstart Norman Duke named William the Conqueror says, hey, hey, I have a sort of convoluted claim to the throne of England. So he amasses a big old army, a really big army, and sits for a long time, right, on the English Channel to wait for the weather to get really good, marches on southern England, uh, defeats uh, the English forces the Battle of Hastings and then marches on London and says, I'm your new king. And England fairly well rolls over and says, okay, I, I guess we speak French now. And uh, England becomes a functionally bilingual country for hundreds of years. Fun medievalist nerd side fact here, we thought for a long time, and maybe some of you, yes you, in school were taught that after the Norman invasion of 1066 that only the aristocracy and the royalty spoke French in addition to English. Uh, in the last 10 years, that's been pretty resoundingly disproven, uh, and we now know that folks were diffusely bilingual to varying degrees across social class um, in England well into the 14 and 15 and hundreds. Um, why does that stop? Well, because of this thing called the Hundred Years' War, and suddenly the French become the big hereditary enemy, and we have to drum up this idea that French is the language of our enemies, and the poor farmers are going, but we've spoken it for 400 years, so fun stuff. So this is why we have this story of St. Alban from England, the proto-martyr of England, in French, right? And it's why I study it as somebody who studies French, right? That's why I get to bring this into my bailiwick. So the life of St. Alban is the story of this Roman citizen, and right away we're told in this version of the story that he was a nobile citoyen, a noble citizen, specifically a noble citizen of Rome. And he's, he is said by the, the writer, the poet, to be dressed in, in golden finery. So right away we have this idea that this guy, who's not especially remarkable, is somebody who is an upstanding citizen, he's an upstanding Roman citizen, and his clothing signifies that, which becomes really important for the story because what's gonna happen is in this time of Christian persecution, there's this priest, who of this you know, new religion, newish religion, certainly newish up here in these British Isles named Amphibolus, which by the way is a word that just means like cloak. So it's, it's clearly a signifier here that's designating the function of the priest in the story. So this guy shows up at St. Alban's house and says, I need a place to stay. And St. Alban says, sure, fine, stay, that, that's cool. 
And, uh, and then um, something happens that I, I like to say to my students, it's like a Broadway musical. So in Broadway musicals, right, people break into song. They're talking, they're talking, and then suddenly they sing, right? They like pivot out and they sing. And we just suspend our disbelief because that doesn't happen in real life, right? Well, in hagiography in Old French, something very similar happens where characters like this priest will come in and say, hey, I need a place to stay. And St. Albans says, okay, great. So, you know, who are you? Well, I'm a priest. And, you know, St. Albans says, well, what does that mean? He says, well, that means that I serve the one true God whose son was Jesus Christ. And, you know, God is three persons in one nature. And you get this, like, 2,000 line sort of summary of the faith, right? And then St. Alban will reply and say, wow, that's really interesting that God is three persons in one nature, blah, 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 <laughs> right? So this text is a kind of catechesis, right? It's a sort of rundown of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And on the one hand, that can get a little boring, that can, that can seem a little trite, but I think there's something also meaningful and even profound in that structure of these stories about the lives of saints that we see here with St. Alban. It's not unlike what we do when we go to liturgy every week, right? We hear these really redundant stories and we say these redundant things, right? We said the Nicene Creed last week. In fact, we said it the week before that, right? But we do it again and again to kind of bathe ourselves in these fundamental ideas about what we believe and who we are. And um, ostensibly, that, that's good for us, right? And I think that something really similar is happening with these stories of the lives of saints, where you have priests often or holy people and then converts who are sort of artificially talking back and forth to each other the content of the Christian faith. Well, that happens. And at the end of this initial encounter, they say, wow, this has been, this has been great. You know, you seem so receptive to this new faith, Alban, you upstanding Roman citizen. Uh, let's, call it, let's call it a night. So they go to bed. Uh, and that's important because that has to happen so that St. Alban can have a dream, and he does. And in the dream, interestingly, he sees a vision of the passion and the death and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm going to show you an illustration of that in a moment that comes from this manuscript. And he wakes up the next day and he says, hey, Amphibolus, priest guy, um, the craziest thing just happened. I had a dream last night where I saw all this stuff that I didn't understand, but it sounds a lot like that story you were telling me yesterday. And that then becomes an opportunity for the priest to say, oh, wow, yeah, no, God has revealed something to you in a really special way here. You are marked out for a special life. Um, and so he, again, kind of gives this rundown, this exegesis of here's what you saw. You saw the passion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. We're learning things. Us aristocratic readers of the text are learning things, right? Well, this is all good and well. And St. Alban is a convert to the faith. He says, I'm in, right? Well, um, what we're told is that through the window, the fenestra, uh, somebody heard what was going on. And uh, essentially, Alban is revealed to the authorities to be harboring this priest. Bad news. So he gets hauled in front of this prince, right, a prince. That's about all we know about him. Uh, and what happens is Alban gets put on trial. Ah, but I, <laughs> I left out a crucial detail that leads to this trial. What happens is... In, when they sort of suss out Alban and the priest, right, that they've been caught, that Alban's been found harboring this Christian priest, this, you know, guy who runs this upstart cult, uh, he decides, Alban says, tell you what, give me your clothing, your priestly garb, and I will wear it in your stead. Right, so we remember that he's set up by the poet with this detail as being dressed in, you know, golden finery, right? So he's going to take off, he's going to strip himself of his garments as an upstanding Roman citizen, and he's going to put on the garments of a priest of the church. This church that he just joined, this new religion that he converted to on the basis of one man and one man's testimony. And he will indeed be seized and tried. And there's this crucial moment where the prince says, hey, you're an upstanding Roman citizen, man. You don't have to do any of this. And we're actually told that St. Alban's parents are out there in the audience of the trial which is this really remarkably powerful moment of pathos, I think, in the story. And, um, and, and St. Alban says, you know, no, I, I'm not going to lean on that. I'm not going to lean on my citizenship of Rome or my social class or my station. I have committed myself to this new Lord, um, and that's just the way it's going to be. He's tried, he's, he's convicted, um, and in keeping with a Roman law, we're going to come back to all this Roman stuff shortly, um, it is said that, well, he's got to be beheaded. 
So he's led out, he's processed forward dramatically to be beheaded, and they get to a river, and it's impassable. And there's some sense in the text that, well, it, they can't follow through on this law unless they can cross the river. Got to be able to do that. Um, and St. Alban prays to God in that moment, joyfully, to peel back the river so that they can hasten his decapitation, so that he can be with his Lord. Um, and in this moment of, you know, zealotry that is very typical of medieval saints, God answers his prayer, and the river rolls back. Praise be to God. Again, we're going to see an illustration of that shortly. And, uh, and he does, in fact, die. You, you saw that a moment ago, right, in very violent fashion. Well, what's interesting is then this, the back half of the manuscript of the life of St. Alban is no longer about him. It's the stories of other saints that spring up in the wake of the life of St. Alban, who are inspired by his legacy, right? And one of the things I want us to talk about in the second half is the way that the church historically has identified saints has very little to do with who they were in their life. That's really important. That's a big half of it. The second half is what happens in the world after they're dead? Right? What kinds of good works, what kinds of fruit spring up after they're dead? That is to say, way beyond their control and within God's control. Right? Um, what kinds of churches get founded 1,800 years later in places that saints might not have ever known about, for instance? So by way of setting up a conversation of those things, I want us to take three minutes to watch this really slick video that was put together by Trinity College in Dublin, they just made this video, praise be to God, um, that details the process by which the folks at the Library of Trinity College just made this manuscript available digitally um, and all the work that they did to do that. And it's, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. I think it's important to see a sense of the material dimension of this text, which comes down to us through one manuscript, and it's the one you're about to see. And it's the one that I was able to look at and harvest all these images from that you're seeing, right? Um, so let's watch this brief video. I can see a couple of medievalists chomping at the bit. Ready for this? Here we go. One moment. The Library of Trinity College is perhaps most synonymous for the Book of Kells, but it's also home to over 600 other medieval manuscripts dating from the 5th to the 15th centuries. The 13th century Book of St. Alban, or Life of St. Alban, is an example of how some of the masterpieces of medieval art can be found within the pages of the manuscript book, perfectly preserved with gorgeous colours. Most medieval scribes remain anonymous, but we know that this book was created by Matthew Paris, a monk, a scribe, a historian and an artist working within the Benedictine community in St. Albans in Hertfordshire. And he produced this between 1230 and 1259. The Book of St. Albans isn't just one text, but a gathering of texts on the same theme. It also features saints, kings, but also other members of the medieval world. You have bell ringers, you have sailors, you have horse grooms, uh, you have builders uh, in particular. Many of the images in this manuscript uh, run across a double page opening, so the narrative runs left to right. This is the Anglo-Saxon King Offa directing the building of the first St. Albans Church. And here you can see many of the building trades and craftsmen depicted. This is the 13th century book of St. Albans. It contains a dossier of works relating to St. Alban and his comrades. It's lives, the story of the rediscovery of Alden's body, and the uh, translation, the removal of his body from one place to another. The story has been told and set down by a Saracen who witnessed it all and himself converted to Christianity, and he hopes that the story will be translated into Latin and into French, and it's in that form that it allegedly occurs in the manuscript. The text here is in French, and that would have made it accessible to a wider range of audience than works in Latin. And we know from a note earlier in the manuscript that Matthew's texts were circulated to noble women, to the king's sister-in-law, to some of the highest people in the land. And we only get a single instance of English, which is in the, a speech bubble in the mouth of this character here, who's saying, go, go, enemy of our city, to Auburn, hmm. as he's led off to execution. And it's telling, I think, that English is put in the mouth of the pagans. Hmm. 
This is the first time the manuscript's available in its entirety, the first time it's available in full color, and now you too, at the click of a mouse, can access a manuscript that Matthew Paris lent to the King's sister. How cool is that? <laughs> All right, we don't need to watch it again. So, but beyond the fact that I like to geek out about this stuff because this is my profession, I think there is just something profoundly meaningful about the fact that you know, a bunch of people on another side of the world right, have dedicated their lives to preserving this book. We've got the one, right? And I can talk with you about this today because of the work that they've been doing. I think that's really meaningful and beautiful. So to, to dig into some of the theological dimensions of this story that's preserved in this book you just saw, so what kind of story is this old French, this medieval French hagiography, this story of the life of St. Alban? Well, we talked about how it's a kind of catechism, right? It's a rundown on the fundamentals of the Christian faith, for those of us who need to hear that again and again. It's a source of inspiration for the Christian faithful in the Middle Ages, right? You're, you're not feeling so committed to your life of faith on a given day. Well, listen, attend the story of this St. Alban. It might be the shot of adrenaline that you, yes, you need to recommit yourselves midway through Lent to whatever it is you're doing. It's a religious origin story for English Christians, right? So again, he's the proto-martyr of Britain, and there's a sense in which the life and sacrifice of St. Alban provides a kind of identity for English Christianity. And it's a reminder of the costs of Christian discipleship, and it's on that that I want to focus in the last 10 minutes before I turn it over to questions. So to gather a few ideas here, I ask, what kind of saint was St. Alban in this story? And I pose that question because there's lots of kinds of saints in the late antique world and in the Middle Ages, and today there are quiet, humble saints whose lives you, know, you couldn't write a sentence about because they didn't do much that would make it into a history book, but they were saints nonetheless. There are loud, brash saints, right, that enter onto the world stage and, and are known for their work, right, the Mother Teresas of the world, right? Um, there, are, there are loud saints, there are quiet saints, and there are politically active saints, there are saints that retreat from the world. So what kind of saint was St. Alban as we receive him in this story? Well, I want to propose to you that St. Alban is first the saint who imitates Christ. This is something that I would argue all the saints share in common, especially in the Middle Ages. Um, the way that I summarize the story to you ought to have for you had a light bulb going off a couple of times where you might have thought, huh, this sounds an awful lot like the story of Jesus in the Gospels, right? You have somebody who is unjustly seized by civic authorities, who's tried before the Roman law, who's given an opportunity by a pilot light figure to exempt himself from all this nonsense, right? You're a good, upstanding person. This person recommits themselves to God anyway. They die, and the wake of their death provides all of these vivifying effects for the community, right? This is a kind of pattern, right, that occurs in the lives of many saints, particularly those coming out of the martyrdom tradition in the ancient church. So St. Alban is absolutely that. He's the saint who's the imitator of Christ. And here I've taken this image. You can see him sleeping here, right? That's him having his dream that I mentioned. And up above the blue there, there's the, the, that, that line of text there says the crucifixion, and you see part of it happening there. So even as early as the dream, he is you know, we begin to see him patterning his life on the life of Jesus. In that spirit, he's also a saint who endures unjust persecution under the law, right? Here he is, you can see him saying, okay, I will take on, right, the priestly garments of Amphibolus at great personal risk, right? And indeed, that's going to be risk that's unto death. He will offer his life up for his new friend, and he will indeed die, um, and you see that intimated here in the exchange of clothing, clothing which signifies that social identity and status. And then here later, right, you see, um, you see him being, the, the persecution is sort of unfolding here in the narrative. And, and here we see him in an even more sort of, you know, the, the colors being drained out of him, right? He looks drab now. Um, here he is being tried before the prince. And uh, this is fascinating because on his left, you see this sort of greatest hits of pagan tropes altar, right? Um, there's Phoebus up there, right? We have this vaguely orientalist depiction of some kind of Mithraic mystery cult meets 
some vague characterization of Islamic piety, right, that's going on. Um, and the idea here is St. Alban is none of these things. He, one of the most common verbs in Old French in here is the verb for to renounce. He keeps renouncing all these things, other religions, other citizenries, um, his own social station for this Christ who he loves. And just to drive home the, the way that his imitation of Christ and his unjust suffering dovetail, I mean, look at, this imita- look at this image here of him being whipped by his persecutors, right? Um, he's doing this, again, with the sort of garments of the church on. And St. Alban is also the saint who chooses God over worldly power and pleasure. Um, you are not expected to be able to see all of this text in detail. I will read it to you. Um, but I just want to remind you that in the beginning of the story, I mentioned that it identifies St. Alban as someone who's an upstanding Roman citizen. Si ancestor estoy romain original. His ancestors were original Romans, the OG Romans, right? Goes on to say, um, when the prince is trying him, right, this pilot light figure, he says, think of your family line from which was born great Roman conquerors. Right? There's a lot packed into that little sentence, right? The prince is saying, I want you to take proper advantage, take full advantage of the fact that you're not only a Roman citizen, but you have blood lineage to the founders of Rome who made conquest of other peoples. You are strong. You come from a line of political might, of stability that has been earned, right? Might equals right, and it runs in your blood, and you should lean on that. And St. Alban says, yeah, I'm not going to do that, 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 or that. Right? I'm going to renounce all of that. And in fact, dude, I've already done that. I've removed those garments from myself and have put on the garments of this new religion that I just joined. And I'm going to, I'm going to put all my stock in that. that. That's what I'm going to go with. And I'm going to renounce my social status, my lineage, my ancestry, my origin, all of it for this new God. Which brings us to the last point, which is St. Alban... He's the saint who yearns for intimacy with God. Uh, you can see him on the right here, he's getting baptized, right? And on the left here, he's, he's you know, humbly supplicating before Amphibolus, right? Eventually, he's going to take on his clothes. So this is someone who just has to hear the story of Christ one time to feel like there's something really exciting, to feel like there's something he needs to get in on, to feel like there's something beautiful that he yearns for and craves and wants and loves and needs in this story. That's all it takes for him, right? And, and the, the chemistry, right, is, is such that his soul and God just spark, right? And, and his sanctity just emerges, right, almost out of thin air. Um, and I think there's something beautiful about that because the example of St. Alban here reminds us that one vision of sanctity, of being a saint, is to be that person who is just giddy with love of God, for whom God is beautiful, who says, yeah, roll back the river, right? Let me, let me get across so we can hasten, right, my journey to my Lord. And indeed, here's an image of that. You can see, you know, this, this guy over here, he's like drinking part of the water to make sure that the river rolls back. Some people got another guy drinking, another guy with a gourd, right? <laughs> Trying to facilitate this process of getting St. Alban across the river. And again, here he is, dying in extremely violent fashion, but you see the tree, right, that's growing up out of this act of violence. And I didn't include this image, but if you look at the next page in the manuscript and we pivot to the next saint, you get a very similar image, but now there's like a forest there. So all this new life is growing up out of this sacrifice. So, St. Alban, he's a saint. Why? Well, I would pivot to a famous line from Irenaeus. He's a saint because he shows us what it means to be a human fully alive. And what is a human fully alive? Well, it's a human whose love for God begins to transform every part of their lives, right? St. Alban, at so many points, could have taken all these off-ramps out of his destiny, right? Even things that would have been ethical from a number of perspectives. But he's so in love with this God in all the areas of his life that he can't abide for any part of himself, to not be conformed to this love, right? Maybe somebody somewhere would have to make that sacrifice, right, and and settle for that, but not this guy, right? Not St. Alban. 
Also, I think it's important that he derives authority as a saint from his humility, right? There's this great line where Amphibolus, the priest, who you saw in that illustration, right, is, is over him as the priest, and St. Alban is listening, but by the end of the story, those roles have been flipped. There's a moment early in the story where, where Amphibolus says, tu seras mi maestra et je te escolaire, right? You shall be my master and I your student. And I think in this story of St. Alban is something fundamental to the church, which is, in theory, when we're doing it right, God works in really mysterious ways that overturn the expectations around power in traditional social roles, right? Um, someone who has been working as a janitor in a church might be your bishop in 10 years, right? Um, and, and they will be your master and you will be their student. You will learn from them, right? Sit at their feet. That's who St. Alban is. He doesn't have the degrees. He doesn't have formation. He doesn't have education. He has the charisma of having heard the story once and said, I'm in. And this priest says, yeah, something really remarkable is going on here. And though I have the training and the credentials, you're much further down the road than I am somehow. And lastly, I just want to emphasize that St. Alban's willing to trade places with the vulnerable and persecuted because of his love for the strange God that he just met. So unlike certain images in our time that people might say of Christian persecution that makes people want to go out into the public sphere and say, hey, I'm a Christian, me, look at me, right? St. Alban does that, but he only does that as a consequence of his desire to protect someone who's gonna die, and he dies in that person's stead. So for the saints, particularly in this medieval tradition that I study, right, coming out in public and saying, hey, I'm a Christian at great personal cost, that is indissociable from the protection of the vulnerable and the weak, right? Um, he's not, this isn't about him. This isn't about St. Alban making a point about his identity, right? St. Alban only has to make a point about his identity before political authority because he wants to save some poor, helpless person's life who isn't protected under the law. Which leaves us, I think, with three questions. St. Alban has been pushing me to think about his life in these three terms, and I offer these to you. How is God calling you to divest yourself of the privileges of station, class, and citizenship in your life? What vulnerable people or populations can we identify with at personal risk to ourselves? And highly relatedly, is God beautiful to us or not? And if not, why not? And as we ask those questions, I, I want to leave you with this juxtaposition of images. Um, that on the left is, uh, is a church that's dedicated to St. Alban in the United Kingdom. And on the right, of course, you see our own St. Alban's Outreach Center here. And what those two things have in common is that they are afterlives of this British proto-martyr who lived 1,800 years ago. And both these buildings and the people who worship in them and the populations that they serve are doing all of that because of this person who was dead 1,800 years ago across an ocean, who had no idea that this would be a consequence of what he was doing. So I started with this really weird title of St. Alban and the 3,600-year legacy. And big reveal, what I mean by that, right, is I want us all to think about what St. Alban's legacy will be 1,800 years from now. What will the half-life of his act of sacrifice for a vulnerable person be? And how will you and I mediate that legacy to the future? Because it's in our hands. St. Alban's dead. Ostensibly, he's praying for us, right? In the by and by, somehow. Um, but you and I are the ones who carry on the name and the image and the legacy of St. Alban. And therefore, it falls to us to ask ourselves, how will we project that legacy of solidarity and sacrifice into a future that we cannot control any more than St. Alban could control the future we find ourselves living now. So, with that uh, nugget of significance that um, I've, I've derived from meditating on this story of his life, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I'll stop talking, and we have five minutes where I'd love to hear any questions you have or thoughts that you have about any of this material. So, thank you very much. Please. Um, do we know what he was the priest, the priest was on this day? 
Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I, if memory serves, he's also, I don't think he gets out clean in the story. I think he's also lumped into the, the bad after effects of this. Um, but let me, let me, let me reread it and get back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Not that, yeah, that seems like the wrong perspective to come from. Um, and that is a huge, like, none of us are called literally to die for what we say we believe in. Maybe we're to die to self in a way, but how do you really take that and look at? Yeah. Come again? Thank you. Yes. So that question uh, from, from Alan, as usual, hitting at the, the core of things is, so if, first of all, are we called to some kind of possibility of literal death, like St. Alban? Um, and based on our answer to that question, what does this legacy or example mean? So as to the first question, I think even in our own time, the question of whether we're called to literally die for others of the faith is usually a function of where we're born and social location. There are plenty of people who are literally presented, you know, with the option of dying for the faith in some sense or for others, which is the same thing, um, all the time. You know, so I would, I would want to challenge us to think that this era is not just in the deep past, it's with us, it's just harder to see sometimes, right? Um, but, but to the second and brilliant question of regardless of that, you know, lots of us are going to die in our beds when we're old, or we're going to die in different ways, and we won't be called to this kind of life. So what is this about? Well, you know, to me, to, to go back to one of those three questions I put, I think for me what matters most, and I think what St. Alban would have us do, is to meditate daily on the question of how am I divesting myself of comfort and power and privilege for people who stand to benefit, right? I may not have a priest coming into my house seeking persecution, um, but I might be confronted with people down the street or in my community who need my time. They might need my money. Um, they might need me. They might put demands on me in ways that are uncomfortable and inconvenient. Uh, and I think that is the sort of essential common denominator of the call to the life of the saint that we all have. It's to be open and willing to the moment where God shows up as an annoying disturbance to our lives and says, I'm going to take your, your money and your time and your comfort from you right now. And it might kill you, right? It might kill me, um, but probably not, right? We're fortunate enough, most of us in this room, where it probably won't kill us. We should probably be ready for it, too. Um, but if it doesn't, uh, I think it's still, uh, it's still the same call to holiness. Yeah, good, please. Yeah. That reminded me that in the scripture, did Christ have to come from a certain lineage to fulfill the Old Testament? Yeah. It got me to think of that. Absolutely. And I love that you raised this point because, right, Jesus in his own way, once again, is setting the, the template of the saints in so many ways. But one of them is, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, where we get this famous moment, right, where the disciples say, hey, like, effectively what they're asking Jesus to do is call on your lineage, Right? Like, you're the son of God, so accept yourself from all this pain and, and suffering. And, and, of course, as you're pointing out, Jesus says, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Right? Like, my father is so much you know, better and more interesting and has the greatest bona fides of all, much better than Roman ones. Right? But even under those circumstances, Jesus refuses to do that. And, of course, he does that same thing, too, of revoking his sort of filiation as God's son, of course, in the 40 days, too, right? where Satan's going to do the same thing. Like, hey... You're the son of God. You rightfully can lean on this lineage, on this power, on this privilege. And Jesus is going to say, no, um, I'll, I'll get bread. I'll rule the world. I'll do all the things you're offering me, but I'm going to do them the long way around, and I'm not going to exploit people along the way. Yeah. Do we know what happened to the priest? Was he blacklisted or anti-saint? 
No, I don't. I don't. It's, it's, a, it's a gap in my memory of that, that part of the story. So I got I to gotta brush up and come back. Uh, but it is, it is interesting to me that it doesn't become a major component of the conclusion of the story, right? That it, he does sort of fall off the radar, and it does all become St. Alban, who kind of takes on that priestly role um, by the end of the story. And you see that in the illustrations, too, right? The way that he goes from Roman citizen to priest. So I'll get back to you. Please. Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Not a problem. Uh, so uh, proto is one of our just $10 million prefixes that means first, right? So in this case, the proto-martyr is like the first martyr, the first martyr of Britain. Um, and, and in some cases, right, that, that prefix is used to mean literally the first historically, sometimes also just the most important, most, most important in significance, right? So here's Alban, who's kind of the, the first image of the martyrs um, in in Britain. That's what I told you. Yeah, of course, of course, absolutely. Yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah. the medievalist at Trinity College made, right, that a lot of these books were destined for courtly women, right, and a, and a, and a female readership, um, because that was an activity that you could do licitly, um, and you're more educated about these things than I am in terms of reading practices in England, but uh, yes, now, here's one thing I'll say, because I'm very undereducated in the non-French lineage of St. Alban's story, but what I can tell you is that there are all these interesting, kooky, stories about, I mean, as, as he even alluded to in the video, of all this lore around how the story is transmitted. So people will say things like, well, there, there was a certain tale that was written in ancient, in an ancient British language, it's actually said in a Latin locution, that passed into Anglo-Saxon and Latin, right? Already there we should throw on the brakes, and again, as you know better than I, the claim there is this is a story that comes down to us from pre-Anglo-Saxon times, right? Like old indigenous folks in, in the British Isles, right? Was that the case? We don't know. We don't have any written record of that stuff, as far as I'm aware, um, in that origin story of the tradition. And a lot of that is probably fabricated, but it's fascinating because it does, if nothing else, I think, attest to the way that the cult of St. Alban had this dramatic forelife way before it becomes this pretty manuscript. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that point is Bede, the great church historian, right, of the 600s-ish, um, does write about St. Alban, and we have some other contemporary sources there. So, you know, that's still three, four hundred years after his life, but um, the, the historical occupation with some figure of St. Alban stretches back at least that far. Yeah. I know i got to pray us out in a hot second. Any final questions or question? Cool. Thank you so much uh, for, for your time and your interest in learning about this with me today. Let's pray. Lord, who inspired St. Alban to love you and find you to be a source of beauty and joy, so much so that he didn't think twice about taking on the garments of the vulnerable and identifying with the persecuted, uh, whether we are called to death in this life on behalf of others or not, may we always keep close to us the inspiring example of your St. Alban and may we be mindful of the call to holiness on behalf of the persecuted as we play this small role in the unfolding legacy of this proto-martyr of Britain. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.